All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm actually be preaching this evening on the office of a bishop. The office of a bishop. And it kind of goes along, I don't know why, it's been on my mind lately since we've been preaching on church attendance, we've been preaching on other things. They all kind of tie together with just how the church ought to be run. And tonight we're going to be looking at the qualifications of a bishop. You know, I, I had said something last week also that I, I want to prove this week. And I, I'd made the, the statement that, you know, bishop, elder, pastor, they're all the same things. And I don't like just saying things like that without giving you proof and reasons why. So tonight I'm also going to cover all that and kind of just, just show you from, from the Bible why that's the case. I don't like leaving things just open-ended like that because I don't expect you to just believe what I say because pastor said it. I expect you to believe things that the Bible says. That's what I expect you to believe. We're here professing Christians. We profess faith in Jesus Christ. We profess faith in God's word. So everything that you believe ought to be based on the scripture. And that's why I try my best to, to focus heavily on scripture when we go through the teaching, when we understand this stuff, because that's what matters. Now, all of that being said, we're going we're gonna to kind of look through not just the office of a bishop, even though that's going to be the main focus, but also in this chapter, it talks about deacons. And this is important just because, I mean, everything that we do is important. We want to try to, to model our lives off of uh, what the Bible says, how we should be doing things, but not just our lives, but the church, how things ought to be run within a church. How do you choose what church to go to? Well, how about looking at one of the places to decide is looking at the leadership, looking at how is the church run? How is it operated? Does it have someone who's even qualified to be running the show, to be pastoring, to have that position? What do you do if, if I were to fall over dead tomorrow? What's going to happen? How do you choose someone else to come up? These are important things to know. Uh, and, and besides all of that, as we go through and look at the qualifications for someone that, that can fit the role or fit the job of a pastor, this is, a, you, you know, don't just tune out and say, well, I'll never be a pastor one day. Listen to the qualifications as we go through this, because this is something that everybody should possess anyways. Now, it so happens to be the minimum as far as just a standard requirement of who God is going to allow to be in this position. But everything that we go through are good, solid Christian attributes that everybody should have or at least strive to have in your own life, regardless of being the, the person leading or running a church, being a pastor. Everybody should, should be able to analyze their own life and be like, well, if I needed to be the pastor for some reason, then I could be because I, I fit the qualifications, right? Whether or not you're actually going to do it is, is insignificant as far as just applying this teaching to yourself. Now, one of the things that's interesting with some of the difference between the New Testament and Old Testament, obviously, we're not sacrificing things. I'm not going to go into all the various differences between the New Testament and Old Testament. However, there's a lot of similarities, even within the structure that God uses for worship, for things being done in his house. While there's no sacrifices, because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice, in the Old Testament, what did you have? Who was it that was running the show, as it were, within the house of God, within the temple, or within the tabernacle? He chose out priests, and then he also had the Levites to help in their course, in the work, in the labor for the Lord. Because operating a church service, operating the, the worship service, you know, back then had to do sacrifices. Now we don't have the sacrifices, but there's still work being done. God ordained leadership within those congregations to get his work done. Old Testament, you had priests, priests of the son of Aaron. And they were put into their specific jobs and specific roles, and they were leading things. They were running things. And you had the high priest, right, who would lead and run, who was in charge of things. But then you had the Levites who were doing other work, very important work, but not in the same role or position that the priests had. They were subordinate to the priests, but they still had very important jobs. In the New Testament church, you have... We'll, we'll use the word, I'm going to use the words interchangeably, just so you're aware, pastor, bishop, deacon. You've got a bishop. They're the one that's in charge of the church. They're the ones that have the higher authority within the church structure. But then you also have positions or offices of deacons 
who also are very busy and have very important jobs within a church, but they don't have the same level of authority as a bishop does. Very similar in regards to just having those two different types of offices from the Old Testament to the New Testament kind of carries forward. Now, let's dig into this to this passage here, starting in verse number one. We're kind of going to do a Bible study through 1 Timothy chapter number three. Verse number one, the Bible says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And I want to focus just on that right there, that last word there, work. Anyone who wants to, to pastor a church, become a bishop, the first thing you have to realize is it's a work. <laughs> it's easy to look at these clowns of pastors that have these huge churches or whatever that I think that many of them get into it literally because it's an easy job for them because they're not really doing a whole lot. They're stroking people's egos and trying to tell people how good they are and how everything is and they feel like, wow, that's all I have to do. I only have to work one day a week. Well, if you want to be fill the biblical position of a bishop, it's not like that. This isn't an easy job to just be like, oh, yeah, I'll just be a bishop and it'll be sweet. I'll have the church that's pay for me and I'll be on easy street and it's a, it's a cush job. No, you desire a good work if you want to be a bishop because the way that God's outlining the job is work. Now, if you want to be disobedient to God and just be like these false prophets out there, then have at it, but you're not going to be right with God and what's the point of doing it then? Then you're just going after filthy lucre which we're going to get to here in a minute. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. It is work. And if you want to do the job right, you have to be working at it. Verse number two, a bishop then must be blameless. And we're going to get into all these. So blameless, what does that mean? Does that mean he has to be without sin? No, of course not. Then, then you'd have nobody being a bishop, right? But blameless, let's just use some common sense here. You're not being blamed for things. You're not, you're not living a life in a, in, in a way that people can just be like, oh, wow, you're at fault for doing this wrong and this wrong. You're not having all these faults in, in areas of your life that are just openly just, wow, the pastors would be blamed for this wrong and that wrong and this wrong and he's breaking the law here and doing this and doing, you know. There's supposed to be someone who's above reproach. Someone who lives their life in a way to where they're not just always being on the hook for stuff. Now, I'm not talking about like doing godly things that may have end up being against the law, right? You got a pastor who's preaching the gospel and, and gets arrested because he's preaching Jesus Christ. That's not what the Bible, that, that wouldn't say, oh, well, he's not blameless anymore, right? It's not what it's talking about. Blameless before God, before God and man, but ultimately under God's authority. A uh, bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, everything that it keeps listing here is still grammatically within the sentence after must be. When the Bible uses words like must be, this isn't just a suggestion. It's not like, well, this would be the best scenario if the pastor was married to one wife. No, it must be. Must be. The pastor must be married to one wife. So when you've got these single pastors out there that graduate from Bible college, they haven't gotten married yet, but they want to start their church and they just become pastor of a church, that's not right. They're not qualified yet. Because according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, they must be the husband of one wife. Now it says the husband of one wife. I don't believe that this is only referring to polygamy. Like, well, you can't have multiple wives and stuff, which, by the way, the Bible never endorsed or was okay with polygamy. God created male and female. And for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, is what the Bible teaches. Not cleave to his wives and, and, you know, and do all this. The time that you leave is when you get married and it's married to one woman, one wife, a man and a wife getting married. That is what the Bible has always taught. Now, man has done differently. Man has gone. Even men of God have gone and gathered to themselves multiple wives. But it was never the right thing to do. It's not right. It's not what the Bible teaches. So when it says this, of course, the pastor shouldn't have multiple wives. 
But there is another way of having multiple wives in the sense of when you get a divorce from somebody and God says that if you marry someone who's put away from their, you know, the, the woman that's put away from her husband, that you're going to commit her to, you're going to cause her to commit adultery. When you put away your wife and, and they get divorced, how is she going to commit adultery? When she goes and, and is with another man. It's not just fornication, that's adultery. You say, yeah, but the marriage is terminated. Yeah, it's still adultery because God considers them married because they made the vow until death do us part. So pastors should not be divorced and remarried and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm the husband of one. No, you're not. You're not. Now, there's also another reason. We'll get to that a little bit later. You know, a pastor needs to be able to rule his own house well. And if you're getting divorced... You've already demonstrated you are not able to rule your house. Oh, but it's all her fault. You're not able to rule your house well. If, you, if your marriage failed in divorce, you have no business getting behind a pulpit trying to run God's church. Amen. So the husband of blameless, the husband of one life, unwife, vigilant. Pastor needs to be vigilant. They need to be on guard. They need to be focused on the things of God and aware of what's going on around them and, and able to stay up with it and stay up with the work and not just be lazy and, and slothful and just kind of eh, push everything off the side. No, you be vigilant on top of things. These are attributes that need to be in a bishop. Sober. What does sober mean? Not just like not drunken, but sober means serious. You're able to, to deal with things seriously. You're not just this big joker, just everything's a big game and laugh, ha, ha, ha doesn't mean you don't have a sense of humor. It's just you need to be able to deal with things soberly and, and seriously. And, and of course, not, not a drunk, but we'll get to that later because that's also listed here. Of good behavior. That, that kind of goes without saying. You should be able to, to be known, not known for someone who's, who's you know, rowdy and cause a bunch of problems. But you know how to handle yourself. You know how to behave yourself. You have good behavior given to hospitality. Another thing that's important, important quality of a pastor, of a bishop, is that you're one who is very hospitable towards people. You, you, you care about people and will do things for people and, and you know, oh, you need, you need somewhere to stay, you need food, you, you know, what can I do for you? Why? Because the job of a bishop is one of a minister, where you're supposed to be ministering to other people's needs. That's why it's important to be given to hospitality. Someone who's generous. You're not, you're not greedy and just and holding on to all your stuff. Look, no. Be generous. Be liberal with your stuff and be given to hospitality. And not only that, that has to do with your character and how you treat people, but also apt to teach. Apt means you have aptitude. You're able to do it. You have the ability to take something but in specifically God's word and be able to explain it to people and teach people and have, give the understanding of God's word uh, behind it. Otherwise, we would just stand here, read the Bible and go home, right? The, one of the jobs of the bishop is to be able to give the understanding and to help people apply it and, and, and really bring the meaning home and understand what the Bible's saying here. So they need to be able to teach. Verse number three, not given to wine. Not someone who, I mean, you shouldn't be drinking booze as the pastor. I say, I know the Catholic Church, they serve wine all the time, and, and they may be given to that, but that is not something that the bishop ought to be given to. It should not be given to wine. Because um, think about it, I mean, alcohol clouds judgment anyways. And I don't know, I don't remember the exact reference, but basically... I think it's in Jeremiah that talks about the, the pastor that's, um, I can't remember the exact way that it's, it talks about the pastor that's like given to wine or that, that preaches that wine. He shall be the pastor of this, of this generation. And it's, ah, uh, now it's going to bother me after I look that one up later. If finds that, let me know if you know what I'm talking about. Does anyone have that reference down? Do you know what I'm talking about? No? Okay. Um, but that's what's just popping in my head right now. 
the priests in the Old Testament were not to be drinking any wine before they'd go into the sanctuary or else God would kill them. God, they would fall down dead if they would drink wine and then go into the sanctuary. So that tells you a little bit about how God felt about things with the priests in the Old Testament. And like I said, I was trying to show you some of the similarities between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the same way in the New Testament. God doesn't want the, the bishop or the pastor of the church being given to wine and perverting judgment. Uh, no striker, right? So not someone who's just easily angered and just, just ready to punch somebody, right? Uh, that's what striking is. Right? You're hitting somebody. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Another very important one. You're not, you're not in it for the money. You're not after money. The pastor shouldn't be caring about and, and always focused on making money. Greedy of filthy lucre. Because that is going to be the wrong motivation for doing this job. With the job of a pastor, you need to be able to tell people the truth which in many cases might offend somebody. You need to be able to tell someone the truth and not worry about, well, are they going to still put money in the offering plate? Are they still going to bring you? you? You need to be able to stand on the word of God and preach it loudly and boldly. And if everybody in the room gets up and walks out because they don't like the word of God, you're not worried about the money walking out the door. You're worried about the people and saying, well, this is what God said and this is what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach and preach doesn't matter about the money. It's the only way you can do that job because the Bible has a lot of things in it that is offensive in the society we live in today. You can't be worried about the money. When you start thinking about the money, you start saying, oh, what can I, what can I say then to bring more people in? Because right, the more people are, the more money is going to be. Well, if I stop talking about these negative things, I could get more people coming in. I could turn the church service into more of a rock concert or into more of a circus or a sideshow that's going to get people more entertained and we could bring people in here and then we'll have even more money coming. And this is where you go with the church. We see a lot of churches like that today. It all just brings in the money. You're not going to hear Joel Osteen railing on sin. That's not, you know, he passes the offering plate around plenty of times, but you're not going to hear him talking about sin. Why? Then he might not have to meet in a big coliseum. Because he'll probably end up offending some people. He doesn't care about them. He cares about their money. See, when you care about someone, when you love someone, you're going to tell them the truth. You're going to tell people that you love the truth. You love someone, you don't want them to die and go to hell. You're gonna, you have to tell them the truth. And part of telling them the truth is telling them, hey, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell. And I don't want you to go there. But you know what? That offends people. Not everybody, but some people get offended by that. Some people might never want to talk to you again. And that's the risk that you run when you love someone and you tell them the truth. You run the risk of them never wanting to talk to you again. We've had plenty of people come in this church I preach the doctrine uh, that, you know, when you get divorced from somebody, if you get remarried, you're committing adultery. The Bible's clear. Don't do that. And people are wanting to get married, but one of them's been divorced. So I tell them, hey, this is what the Bible says. And I can't tell you how many times people have just left the church completely. Now, do I want them to leave? Did I say, get out of here? No. Didn't have to say any of that. I'm just preaching God's word. And the reason why I do it is because I don't want them making a mistake. I care about those people. It's a little uncomfortable because I know that's not what they want to hear. People have been dating for a while, maybe even a couple years. They had no idea it's wrong. But now all of a sudden they hear something. They've been planning on getting married. They love each other. But the Bible still says what it says. Right. Right. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy for them. It's not easy to, to make the right choice necessarily, but that is the right choice. And if I just lied to your face and said, no, go ahead and do it. It's, it's just fine. <laughs> Shame on me and woe unto me, man. I don't even know. I, I wouldn't want to face what God's going to do to me for not 
telling other people and warning other people and sharing the truth of God's word. So all of that said, pastor can't be greedy of filthy lucre. There's so many areas of where you'll fail if you're thinking about and motivated by money. But what does the pastor need to be? But patient. Patient. In so many ways, and, and it, it amazes me how much the analogy of family, the truths behind a family relationship work its way into the Bible in God's relationship with us and even the relationship with the church. I mean, there's just so many ways where it works. But we're going to see here that the pastor is, in a sense, he's got this job of kind of being a, a parent within, like, over the church. And it's not exactly the same as in the home. I get it. But you see a lot of similarities, a lot of overlap, and even the qualities. You have to pick someone who's good at being a parent at home in order to be running the church. So when it's important to be patient, just like it's important for parents to be patient at home. In a church, you're going to have people of varying degrees of spiritual growth. You're going to have newborn babes in Christ, and then you'll have other people that are adult children or, or, you know, children of God and everything in between. And in order to successfully manage and oversee the operation that's going on, you need to be patient. And you especially need to be patient with people who've got a lot of problems in their lives. And there's a lot of fixing up that needs to happen. You need to be patient because you're trying to help people. Very important quality as a pastor. And men, if you, if you have this desire, you think maybe one day you want to be a pastor, just keep these things in mind. And we saw this morning, patience comes from going through tribulations, from going through trials, from going through experience. And this is one of the reasons, as we go through this, just keep this in mind. If you're wondering, what does Pastor Burzens do? Well, how, what do I need to do to be ordained? I don't like, I'm not going to be ordaining really young men to the ministry. I'm not going to do it. 20, 21, 22, nope, I'm not going to do it. I don't care if you have two children. I, and I don't have a specific age set, just so you, you understand that, but, but I'm talking about young. You need to have yourself established in these areas before you take on the job, the work of being a pastor. It is really important. I mean, someone who's overseeing the whole church. This is, a, this is a huge work that we have undergoing here, and there's not that many people in our church. But there's a great work being done. And if you've got someone not fulfilling, not having these, the proper qualities, how easily can we just be shifted off course? How easily can everything just come to nothing because you got the wrong person leading it? Because you got someone who's just not patient. You got someone who's not uh, uh, given the hospitality. You got someone who just, you know, they're not right for the job. And when I end up ordaining somebody, it's going to be because I feel like they're right for the job. They fit these requirements and, and, and have the confidence that they're going to succeed. I don't want to send out failures. And I brought this up in the preaching class. You know, we have high standards. I want to have high standards. I want people to excel. I don't want you just to, to try to get by at the bare minimum and just say, oh, check, 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 check. First of all, when you're looking at the office of a bishop, it's not up to you to decide when you're ready. It's up to other people to decide when you're ready. You don't get to choose. <coughs> Adam Fannin. <laughs> you don't decide, oh, now I'm ready to pastor a church. It's not your place. You're supposed to be deemed worthy of other people. And other people who are qualified to make that decision, by the way. Think about this. If I just, not ever being ordained, just kind of broke off, just, just one day decided, you know what, I want to be a pastor. And I start talking to different people and, and get people, go out soul winning and get them all gathered at my house. And I know more than all of them. 
right? And they say, well, you should be our pastor. But they're all just like spiritual babes in Christ. Is it really going to mean something for them to say, oh, yeah, you fit the bill? They're like a bunch of babes in Christ. What do you mean? How would you even know? You don't even have the discernment to, to, to know enough and been doing it long enough and experienced long enough and have the knowledge to make that type of judgment call. It's ridiculous. And we're going to get into ordination a little bit later, too, um, just depending on time where we go with things here. So where was I? Be a patient, not a brawler. Again, striker, brawler, not someone. You know, your pastors shouldn't just be getting into fights. All right, bottom line. I mean, fist fights. Why? Because people get upset when you talk about the Bible. So if the pastor's a brawler or a striker, there's a lot of opportunities to be getting into fights when you're preaching the Word of God. And the man of God needs to be humble and not ready to just go to blows with people because you say something that's offensive or they say something to you that's offensive. That should just be part of their character. That, that has to be there. And again, not covetous. It's the same thing as greedy or filthy lucre, except covetousness is more broad. It's not just limited to money. It's anything. Covetous over other people's families, other people's wives, other people's children, other people's cars, other pe whatever. Anything that's just belonging to someone else that you want and that you can't have, that's covetousness. Verse number four, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And this kind of goes back to um, why, I, you know, just having, first of all, it says having his children. So it doesn't say having his child, having his children. So it's implying there's more than one. The reason why that's important is because, um, you know, there's a lot of people in the church. The Bible says, well, number one reason why it's important, the Bible says having his children. But also, it says here, one that ruleth well his own house. The husband's in charge. The man of the house is in charge. The father's in charge of his house. And I've covered this last week on ruling and everything, so I'm not going to get into that tonight. But when you're ruling your own house, it's demonstrating the skills that you need to rule over the, the church and the house of God and having his children in subjection with all gravity. All gravity is, again, means, think about gravity. What's gravity? It's a force, the downward force, a weight. Gravity is seriousness, soberness, um, something that has weight to it. So a qualified bishop will be running his house and when he's telling, you know, children, sit down. Children, stop doing that. Children, come here and be quiet. You know, they listen to him and, and they see, they're serious about it. They know, oh, I better listen to dad. It's important quality. Now look, little kids, <laughs> little kids, we're not worried about the one-year-old. Oh, Oh, pastor's one-year-old isn't, isn't being obedient, right? You use proper judgment again, but especially as they start getting older. But if you, you know, there's a big difference between the person who, man, the kids are just all over the place. No one's listening. Dad's just saying, okay, kids, you know, and just nobody cares. Nobody says anything versus the one who's got everybody lined up. Yeah, you may have a, a, a need for correction now and then, but they're getting the correction, right? Um, very, pretty straightforward. But I also think, that's why I don't have a checkbox of just, well, you have to have two children and just, okay, my second child is, is newborn or is two months old. Now I'm ready to start a church. How can you tell if, if, if they're ruling their house well and their children are in subjection when you've got a two-month-old? You've got to let the children grow enough to be able to demonstrate, hey, here's, a, here's someone who knows how to run his house. Now, people could learn how to run their own house well, even without ever going to church. I mean, there's people who never go to church that still run their house as well. So that's an attribute, though, that, that someone needs to have um, coming into this. And, and if you already have a, a well-run house, then praise God, that's great, because that's just one more, one more area where uh, that'll help you if you are seeking the office of a bishop. Now, and it says in verse number five in parentheses here, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? 
showing that you know you've got this smaller scope of your own house if you can't handle it there then there's no way you're going to be able to handle all the management and everything that needs to go on behind behind the scenes at a church verse number six another thing very important not a novice what's a novice a novice is a beginner a novice would be someone who's just just not that experienced, not that learned, not, you know, more things are new. It comes from the root of, of what new is, right? Um, novice. Lest, and this is the warning, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So, uh, you know, a bishop needs to be someone who's been around. They're experienced. Definitely have knowledge. I mean, you have to have biblical, scriptural knowledge in order to teach doctrine, in order to teach right from wrong, you can't just be a newbie to the faith. You know, we're not going to ordain someone. I don't care if they've got their, the family in order. They're not given to wine. They're meeting all these criteria, right? They're not a striker. They're patient. They're not a brawler. They're, they're given to hospitality. They're of good behavior, right? You're just going down. It's like, man, this person's got all these qualities. But if they're still a novice, if they just got saved last week, and they're just this new, this new person, just a complete novice. They're not ready yet. Now, it doesn't make them a bad person because they're a novice. It just means they're a beginner. It just means that they need to learn a little bit more and they need to continue on. So um, the warning here, though, too, is that someone who's a novice, someone who's a new person, has a tendency to get lifted up with pride as they're, they're running the church and they're, they're starting to get all this attention on them as the pastor, as the bishop, as the man of God, and it starts to go to their head instead of someone who's been around for a while and say, no, this is, you know, how to deal with these situations appropriately. And it says, Let's li being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil because that's, uh, the devil's sin was pride. Also, verse number seven, moreover, he must have a good report of them that which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare or the trap of the devil. The devil doesn't want a lot of you know, the good work going on in churches. The devil wants there to be, uh, you know, doesn't want there to be soul winning and people being reached and lives being changed and the gospel being preached. He doesn't want that, so he's going to try to stop that from happening. And one of the ways he's going to do that is try to attack the pastor, try to attack someone who's in the position of leadership that's actually running and overseeing the church to, uh, to get him to fall or to fail and one of the ways is by attacking uh, him through trying to get the pastor to sin so what I was saying earlier you know the pastor needs to be someone who's above reproach that you're not just guilty of these sins because otherwise you're not of good report you don't have a good report people are without they're saying yeah I saw pastor versions walking in the bar the other night that's not a good report that's a bad report for someone to say that about the pastor of the church. Oh yeah, I saw Pastor Virgin doing this. I saw Pastor Virgin do that. That is a snare of the devil when you can fall into that type of reproach. And we're talking about a true report, not a false report, right? Now we're going to transition into the deacon. Verse number eight. Likewise must the deacons be grave. Grave again, meaning sober, serious, not double tongued, they're not speaking out of both sides of their mouth, not given to much wine not greedy of filthy lucre. We see an overlap in many of the qualifications here. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Now, I, I, I wanted to really come into this because of this verse, verse number 10. It says, let these also first be proved. So, when someone is going to take the office of a bishop, they need to be proved. Proven is like tested. Right? You're testing them. You're going to make sure, okay, are they meeting the qualifications? You need to be proven and then accepted. It's not something that just someone just comes in. And that's why like, you know, a lot of churches will just kind of hire pastors and just people come in. They need to be proved before you can really get that job. And I know there's churches that are in bad situations. It might be hard and there's nobody within the church that are able to take over. So it's kind of a difficult situation, but you need to make sure you're going through the right steps to prove these people to make sure that, um, that they fit the bill, that they're, that they're not um, going to fail in any area. But the deacons also need to be proved. You need to look at the, the, the life and the, and the character of a, of a deacon. It says, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. 
Say, okay, they, they, they fit the bill, they fit the criteria. Now we're going to ordain you as a deacon. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And I think it brings up the wives just because in case you didn't understand what it means to be ruling your own house well, it brings up children, but it also brings up the wives because at the end of the day, the husband is responsible for everything that goes on in the family. For the wife's behavior as well as the children. Everything reflects back on the father or the husband. They are the ones who are ultimately responsible. So the wives cannot be, you know, slanderers, just, just, or, or tail bearers, right? They need to be sober, faithful, serious in all things, you know, um, because they are taking after their own husbands. Verse number 12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. So same rule there, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree in great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. That last verse, verse 13, that we're looking at, you don't go and get your college degree first and then become the deacon because you have a degree. The Bible says, first, you use the office of a deacon. First, first you're qualified and checked and proven. Now you're proven. Now you can use the office of a deacon. Now you can fulfill this role. And as you're fulfilling that role, then you've purchased to yourself that good degree. You get that degree of achievement by doing the job. You don't get the degree first and then start doing the job. Does it make sense? But see, people are, are people trying to pattern churches after the, the world the world's philosophy of saying, oh no, just like, like in the world, you, what do you do? You go off to a trade, you go off to college to then get a job, right? Well, they're saying, well, church should be the same way. You go off to a Bible college and then you start job as a pastor. You're not going to find that anywhere in Scripture. Good luck trying to find the concept of someone being sent off to be taught and trained by just some other people in some school somewhere and then coming back or going somewhere else to start some church. That's not the way God set things up. God has the proving grounds right here in the local church. Why? Because what is this chapter even talking about when you finish reading the chapter? It says in verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You're proving people in the house of God, not off in some Bible college. People are being taught and trained within the local church. And then you know when someone's able to fit the bill and be able to pastor a church through those means. Now, jump back to chapter 2 real quick because I didn't cover this at first so I wanted to get to these other verses. But in verse number 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, because it is a man's job. And in chapter 2, it's going to be even more explicit as to <laughs> what the woman's role versus the man's role is. You say, oh, you're, you're, you know, misogynistic. I can't believe that you would say that, Pastor Berzins. Don't you know it's a 2019 and women could do everything that men could do and men could do everything that women could do and we're just all for equality here and there's no difference at all and everyone could just use the same bathroom and everyone should just wear the same clothes and there should just be no difference between men and women. That's what Satan would have you to think, but that's not how God thinks. That's not what the Bible says. God has value on men and women. That's equal. God values women. God values men. But he's given us different jobs. I still feel ridiculous having to stand up in front of people and say such a simple <laughs> statement. Unfortunately, it needs to be said. There's so many brainwashed people out there that are falling for these lies that, oh, we're, we're all just the same. I mean, God created us physically different. Like just visibly, you look at a woman, you look at a man, it's, they're not the same. And they have different characteristics and functions that God has created us for. Men are stronger than women. I don't care what you tell me. I don't care how much you don't like that. That is a biological fact that men are stronger than women. More strength, more muscles, can bench press more, can do more push-ups, can do more sit-ups. Men are stronger. They're going to win in a fight. 
women have all of their own skills and qualities that are way better than men. I believe women can multitask way better than men can. Women are able to handle all kinds of different things going on simultaneously. Phone calls, kids screaming, food going over here, the dishwashers, whatever, all this stuff going on. Guys, not so much. Okay, so look, I'm not going to get into all that. Men and women are different. Just deal with it. And when it comes to authority, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to the roles in society, in church, in the family, God has a different plan for men versus women. It's a man's job to be in charge, overseeing the church, not the woman's job. Women have other jobs that they can do for the Lord. One of them is not pastoring a church. Abundance of clarity in chapter number two. Because if you say, oh, well, when he says if a man desires office, that just means it could be a man or a woman. Well, let's look at verse number eight in chapter two. Verse number eight. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. We already looked at this verse this morning. So what's he saying? Hey, I want women that, that are claiming to be godly to have good works. So should women be working for the Lord? Sure. Should they have good works? Yes. God wants women to have good works. But let's keep reading. Verse number 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now, do you think he just means, well, when he says woman there, he means man or woman. No. You never find that in Scripture. Now, you may be able to find some places where he says, you know, for, uh, uh, about, you know, especially with salvation and talking about a man. Yeah, you apply the same thing for men and women. But you're never going to find where the Bible is specifically talking about women and just be like, oh, yeah, well, you can just apply that to men and women. It's never, never going to find that. Let the woman learn in silence with all subject. What does subjection mean? You're under authority. You're being subject while you're learning. Right now, there's teaching going on from the Scripture. Learning should be happening uh, um, within the church. Now it's time for women to be silent. Let women learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 12, but I suffer not. Suffer means allow. I don't allow a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So I don't want them teaching, and I don't want them usurping authority over the man. Meaning, the man has the authority over the woman. That's what the book says. Again, you don't have to like it, but you can't change what it says. That is what it says. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. And then he goes on to explain that a little bit. You know, I was preaching this morning about, you know, all the different things that we need to have. You need to have the faith, right? And then the virtue, and then the knowledge. So here's one of those perfect illustrations. You don't have to understand, well, why can't a woman, huh? Why can't a woman, why does a woman have to be silent in church, huh? I'm not going to obey that. I'm not going to follow that until you give me a good reason why I have to. Look, if God's word says it, just obey it. Even if you don't understand why that is, even if you think you could be a better pastor, even if you think I could do a much better job, I should be up there teaching, the Bible says no. No, it's very clear. There's no way around this. But here he continues on to give the explanation, right? For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, you know, the commandment was given unto Adam, hey, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Every other tree you can eat from, don't eat of that tree. Eve was told that, Eve knew that. Eve knew, hey, we're not supposed to eat of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? The serpent came. Did the serpent deceive Adam? No. The serpent deceived Eve. She was deceived. He tricked her. You say, yeah, but the serpent tricked... Yeah, yeah, but she was more susceptible to being deceived than Adam was. And again, this goes back to men and women being different. And this is the reason given as to why women aren't supposed to teach. It's not because, well, what Eve did is just... 
now you're just cursed for the rest of your life. No, it's because Eve was a woman and, and Adam was a man, and the woman is more susceptible to being deceived. That's why when you read about false prophets, it says they go into houses leading captive silly women laden with sins. Because it's easier for the false prophet to gather a bunch of women after them following them because women are naturally more inclined to follow the leadership, strong leadership from a man. It's a, it's a fact. That goes back again to Genesis when he said unto the woman, unto Eve, that, um, that your husband's going to rule over you and your desire shall be to your husband. Your desire is coming from within. That's innate. Women have a natural tendency to want to be, to, that, that are going to be to their husband. And I know people fight that and, and the statements might make people angry because it's not popular. But it doesn't matter if it's popular. It matters if it's right. It matters if that's what the Bible teaches. So, continuing on here. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. I'm not going to get into all that. That's not talking about their soul being saved. But um, running out of time here. Let's cover some ordination now. Oh, wait. Before I get there, elders, bishops, pastors. I said I wanted to prove that to you. First of all, I'll just give you a little bit of the, uh, the definitions of those words. So elder is very simple. It's pretty much what you would think. Older, elder, more senior, more experienced, right? In the application of the church, it's, I don't think it's just talking about like physical age, but experience, elder within the things of God, with you know, being around, not a novice for sure, someone who's an elder, someone who's been around, someone who's, who's experienced and knowledgeable, and, and, and has that behind them to kind of be considered elder, senior, so more, more seniority. Um, that's one title. You've got pastor, which a pastor is another word for a shepherd. And the etymology of pastor comes from Latin. That literally means uh, from passer, I don't know how you pronounce it, to feed. And I, I looked this up. I already knew what the words meant, but, but when you look at the etymology, it's just basically about a, a shepherd. And if you think about pastures, real similar to pasture, you know, the, the, the sheep go out to pasture, and the pastor is watching over the pasture, and that's where you get that word from. So you've got the role of an, uh, uh, an elder, a pastor, and then a bishop is, uh, is the, another word for bishop is overseer. Someone who's just kind of managing and overseeing things. And again, you can go back to the etymology of that word as well. It's someone who's watching, someone who's overseeing. That's what those words mean. Now, all of those are interchangeable. They all, it, it's all pertaining to the same office. Because all three of those functions are things that are required of the person holding that office to have or to have those characteristics or traits of. Someone who's a pastor is someone who is shepherding a flock, right? Kind of watching out, protecting, feeding. That's the job in this office, the office of a pastor should be doing. The elder has to have the knowledge, the experience, the, the you know, things that would go along with being an elder. And then the same thing with a bishop overseeing, managing, running, making sure everything's being done in order, right? All three of those things are, are attributes assigned to the same office. Now, how does that be, how is that proved biblically? We'll turn to Titus chapter 1. Just go forward a couple pages in your Bible, Titus chapter 1. You're, if you're still in 1 Timothy, it's, just, it's literally just right after 2 Timothy, you got Titus. Titus chapter 1 is, is a parallel passage with 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. So the Apostle Paul is giving Titus a job. And he's saying, you're left in Crete because there's things wanting. Wanting means lacking. There's churches there, but they don't have elders ordained within those churches to fill that office. Okay. And then he says in verse 6, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. So now he's going into this list, 
for ordaining an elder, which mirrors the list that we just read in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's all the same things. Obviously, it's talking about the same job, except here, instead of saying bishop like it did in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says elder. Well, that should tell you it's the same job, but let's continue. Verse number 7, for a bishop must be blameless. So even within the same context, he says, you need to ordain elders. Here's the qualifications because a bishop must be. Well, what more do you need? Elder and bishop is talking about the same thing. Very clear. Um, pastor, not as clear cut. Like this is just really easy. I mean, this is interchangeable elder and bishop in the same context within the same few verses. Um, but pastors, once you see that the elder and the bishop have the same job, the same function, same office, it's not that hard of a stretch to look at the pastor. And with the pastors, I'm not going to go through all of the references, but you could look through the different references that scripture uses to refer to a pastor. And I'll read a few of them for you just to show you that I'm not just making this stuff up. But basically, it's the same role, the same office that's being held as the bishop or the elder. Uh, Jeremiah 3.15 says, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So these are pastors that are going to feed you. They're, they're over the flock, right? Verse 10, uh, Jeremiah 10.21, For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. So this is talking about pastors not doing a good job and being over a flock. What's a flock? It's a group of people. Because this is a person in the job. It's, he's not talking about lambs and sheep, literally. He's talking about people being a pastor. So how else are you going to apply someone being over a group of people other than, you know, and being in an office and being responsible for feeding them other than someone filling the office of a bishop or an or or elder? Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 17. And this is even from, uh, from, his, from Jeremiah's perspective. Jeremiah 17, 16. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Um, on and on, Jeremiah has the most references just to using the word pastor. That's kind of where it's mo almost exclusively found in Scripture. The Bible says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Um, and then in Ephesians 4 in the New Testament, the Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So you have another reference to pastors there. But when you look at it all, it's basically, it's the same, it's the same, uh, the same position. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, one more reference here. Uh, this is now referring more to Jesus, but it's using shepherd, which would be a pastor, and bishop, as being the same thing. It says, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. The shepherd and bishop, right? It's the same person. That's talking about Jesus Christ as the shepherd and bishop of your souls, but using pretty much interchangeably there. So let's go on to ordination and we'll be done. I just want to cover this real quick just because uh, it's important. People do weird things. And you don't want to get wrapped up in uh, even just following the wrong people out there. Look at Hebrews chapter number 5. Almost done. Hebrews chapter number 5. Hebrews 5 clearly is going to show us that there is no such thing as, as self-ordination. God doesn't recognize someone who just ordains themselves. Ordain just means you're choosing, right? No one just chooses themselves to, to have a particular job. Hebrews 5 shows us not even Jesus Christ chose himself for the job that he did. Okay, and if Jesus Christ wasn't able to choose himself, who do you think you are to ordain yourself to some position? Well, I'm just going to pass through this church because I think it's right. And of course, they always say, oh, well, the Holy Ghost ordained me. Really? How do you know that? How do you know that? Oh, well, it was the Holy Ghost. You know, when the Holy Ghost ordains people in the Bible, 
other people are, do, are still involved with that in laying on of hands and doing the ordaining. It's not just the Holy Ghost. It's, there's still people involved. Just like you say, well, it's the Holy Ghost that saved that soul. Yeah, but you, you needed to have somebody there preaching the gospel too. It's a, it's a joint effort. So you can't just say, oh, well, the Holy Ghost ordained me, so here I am. I'm just anointing myself, right? Ordaining myself. Here we go. Uh, he, let's look at the scripture, though. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men, in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron." Verse number four, no man take this honor unto himself. It's an honor to serve the Lord. It's an honor to have this job. It's an honor to be ordained, like being ordained as high priest. And notice there some of the same things, you know, compassion on the ignorant, someone who cares about people, someone who's patient with people, having this type of job, but you can't just take that job on yourself. No man take this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. Aaron was called of God. Aaron was chosen to be in that position. He didn't just say, well, I'm, I'm the one that should do it. I'm the one who has the qualifications. No, he was chosen to do it. Verse 5, so also, in the like manner, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation and all them that obey him. And it goes on and on. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ himself didn't give him the honor of being the high priest. He was ordained of the Father to have that job and was given that honor. And he didn't just say, nope, nope, it's going to be me. It was given to him. And honor can only be bestowed on someone else. You can't lift up yourself. You can't just, just expect to have positions and authority and everything just, just on yourself. It needs to be given to you. The honor needs to be given. You can't take it to yourself. And people who want to ordain themselves are just taking an honor upon themselves that they have no business and no right to take. Turn to Acts chapter 14. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Acts chapter 14. Because we're just going to see here an example. You say, well, what about, well, how did these other churches start in the New Testament? How did they all start? I mean, you mean to tell me that there was someone that, that they had to wait until somebody can ordain that person? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And you think about that. The Apostle Paul, Barnabas, other disciples, apostles are going out, they're preaching the gospel, they're getting a lot of people saved all over the place, all over the world. And literally, they're starting churches all over the place. But not all these churches had bishops, had elders, had pastors ordained to run them. But because their job was to go out and reach people and preach the gospel, they're getting these people together. They're kind of doing some, some teaching and training, but then they're moving on. But then they cycle back. They don't just forget about them and leave them. They come back and say, no, we still need to finish the job. But in the meantime, people are going to be sent to, to help to teach and to help bring them up to speed. And there are a lot of people going from Antioch and going to these various churches that have been established and doing teaching and doing training and, 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 and you know, preaching to these people there. And they're spending time getting to the point to where somebody can be ordained, someone can be proven to fit the bill and follow those requirements. And then they can be ordained and then they're going to be commended to the Lord as we see in Acts chapter 14. Look at verse number 21. The Bible reads, And when they had preached the gospel of that city and taught many, 
they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter in the kingdom of God. Verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church, who's they? The disciples, the apostles who are going around and starting a church, they are the ones that ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting. You say, how do you know that for sure? Because they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Because when they commend them to the Lord, they're saying, all right, you're on your own now. You're completely on your own. When they're commended to the Lord, okay, now you're just answering to the Lord. Prior to that, they were answering to these apostles. They were answering to the apostle Paul. Why do you think we have these epistles like the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth and he's saying, look, you guys are doing things wrong and you need to get your act together because I'm going to show up and I'm going to set things in order. What authority does Paul have? Well, they weren't an independent church yet. They weren't under their own overseer yet. The Apostle Paul was coming. And besides all that, I mean, the apostles kind of had a position above the, the, the pastor anyways. But still, he's over there saying, no, we're going we're gonna to get this stuff in order. And he had the authority to do so. Um, people need to be ordained. But once they had ordained elders, as we saw here, they commended them to the Lord. All right, now you're under the direct authority and rulership of Jesus Christ. That's it. And that's the way it works when you have new churches started. You could start churches without having a pastor right there because you're going out, getting people saved, gathering people together, you're teaching, you're training, but now you're working with that group. Someone is. And what we see in the Bible is the church at Antioch was doing a lot of this. They had a lot of missionary work going on, a lot of people being sent out and traveling back and forth and, and, and training up these churches until they were able to ordain elders in every church. And once they ordain the elder, okay, now you're commended unto the Lord. They're going to move on and focus on a different church. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. It's completely biblical. I mean, that's, that's the model we see going on in the church. And you know what? This is an important doctrine. It may not be the most exciting and most interesting, but it's important. I mean, people need to figure out, how do I, get, how do I find the right church? Who's doing things the right way? Maybe you want to serve. Maybe you want to minister. Maybe you want to pastor one day. Maybe you want to be an evangelist. Maybe you want to be a deacon. I don't know. Whatever it is, you want to serve in some capacity. Let's learn to do things the right way. Let's do it according to Scripture, the way it's already been spelled out for us. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us all the instruction that we need to do things in this, in this world. Lord, we thank you for um, loving the church and that Jesus Christ shed his blood and died for the church, Lord. I pray that you please help us to do things uh, decently and in order and do things properly here in our church, Lord. We just want to serve you. We want to do it to the best of our ability, and, and we just ask for you to open up our wisdom, open up our understanding, Lord, and, and help us to have wisdom and knowledge to be able to run things th in a way that's pleasing in your sight. God, we want to serve you, and we want to, we want to reach as many people as possible with the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.